This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, uh, this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It must be Monday because we're going to do Mina, Marco, and me, and Michael on Monday uh, today, all about energy. Uh, so welcome to Think Tech for the week of broadcasting. We'll do 30 shows this week. It's, it's going to be a busy week. And we have a special guest today on our Mina, Marco, Michael, and me, and that's Michael, Michael Hastings. He's the CEO of Half Moon Power, which is doing a project on Molokai. So welcome both you guys to the show. Marco by Skype from uh, Skype Audio from uh, from Hilo and um, Michael Hastings by Skype uh, Audio, maybe video, I'm not sure, uh, from Chicago. Isn't that great? Welcome to the show to you, Marco. Tell us what's going on. Well, thanks so much, Jay, and it's great that we can keep our alliteration going with yet another M person. So uh, super to have Michael with us today. If we can't have Mina Michael, I'm sure, will be a fantastic guest for us and talk about uh, something near and dear to my heart, which is what's going on on the beloved island of Molokai. So thank you two for, for joining. Yeah. And Michael, sure, welcome to you. Thanks for having us. Michael, tell us, uh, you know, tell us a little about your background, about your company, and then we'll ask you about your project. Um, yeah, sure. For, I mean, for me, it's, it's really uh, visceral. I spent, like, a previous career uh, living in Asia, and I watched the environment there deteriorate, the, you know, it was there between 1990 and 2002, and, you know, it used to be blue skies and cleaner water, but then by the time I left, you couldn't even, like, see more than, like, half a mile on many days because the pollution was so bad, and there was, like, so much coal soot being, like, you, you get so dusty everywhere, and it's just, it was, like, just noxious fumes. It was really hard to to deal with that, but on the economic side, we were um, doing banking, and we had done like all these IPOs for these um, big state-owned enterprises. And you know, China was trying to develop as well as the rest of emerging Asia, and it was just like it became like actually very clear to me, you know, back then that you know competition over finite resources like coal and oil is just you know there's there's no way that the Earth can sustain eight billion people you know, driving big SUVs and so forth. So it was, like, really important for me that, you know, we figure out how to um, make renewable energy work so we so everybody can use electricity, you know, reliably, cost-effectively, and without polluting. And so I didn't really know much about um, renewable energy, but fortunately we were pretty early in the game, and um, we raised friends and family capital to do uh, a portfolio of uh, large-scale wind projects in in the mainland, uh, primarily in the Midwest, like Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And so we kind of like learned the industry from the ground up and we were able to uh, sell our original portfolio of wind farms to, to larger developers. And then um, because of these uh, connections I had to Asia, we set up a joint venture with a, a true um, independent power producer that was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange uh, called Concord New Energy. And they were really interesting as far as, like, a partner for, for the U.S. They were looking to diversify outside of China, but they had no government ownership, and it was, in fact, like 10% owned by the International Finance Corporation. So we knew that they were, like, squeaky clean in terms of, like, finding a, a partner from Asia. And it was a really good um, venture. We ended up uh, building a portfolio of um, solar projects around – uh, the U.S. So we are, the portfolio includes some operating projects in Hawaii, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Rhode Island, and New York. And um, but it really started getting interesting to us in the past couple of years. Um, you know, as we've kind of developed an expertise in renewables, when we became familiar with how we can um, operate uh, batteries integrated with with uh, solar, because that, that helps you firm up your generation and able, enables renewables to become baseload, which for, you know, for decade, decades was pretty much elusive. So um, we built a project um, about two years ago in Ohio, um, in a small town of Minster, and that was the first municipal scale integrated solar storage project. And we were not only able to offer the town inexpensive solar, but we were also able to help them reduce demand charges with batteries and 
do all these other ancillary services would help improve uh, power quality. So we kind of really cut our teeth on that. And, um, you know, we, we just decided that the direction of our business was going to focus on smaller scale uh, solar and battery projects because we think that, um, you know, it's the confluence of two really uh, kind of like commoditizing technologies, which is lithium ion batteries and, and solar cells. They've, they've become so cost competitive now that um, to, to us, at least, the future is this is a very, um, very uh, growth oriented opportunity right now. So, um, to Molokai, we had um, we'd always wanted to do more. I mean, any, anybody from the mainland wants to do. What attracted you to Molokai? Hawaii, of course. What attracted mm -hmm. you to Molokai, Michael? By the way, I'm developing uh, so the M words today. So I have Marco, I have Mina, even though she's not here. I have Michael, I have me, I have Monday. I have Minnesota, I have Michigan, I have Munster. Minster, was that the town you were in? Yep. And, and that, now I have Molokai. So I think we're almost at 10. That's 10, right. is, 10 is my goal. We're almost there. Yeah. Anyway, so what attracted you, uh, what attracted you to um, uh, Molokai? That's, well, it that's was, a long it was way funny. So uh, this developer that uh, finds projects for us, um, he'd been kind of like a the golden goose. He'd, he'd always identified these really interesting opportunities for us. And um, he suggested Molokai like four years ago. He said he knew some landowners there. And so they arranged a call with Maui Electric and we had that conference call. And um, it was just, it was kind of intriguing just because of the 100% renewable mandate. And, you know, we knew the batteries was going to play a big role here. So that, that project didn't really pan out anywhere, but um, Maui Electric, uh, told us there was another developer uh, from San Francisco that was working on a project for Molokai that was an integration of solar and storage. And I just kind of cold called that group and we ended up um, acquiring the rights to the project from them. Oh, you succeeded and them. Was, what was the name of that company again? Uh, the name of the company was Princeton. Yes, we had, we had a couple of shows with them back a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're, yeah. you're actually on the same track they were on. But how does your project differ from what they were doing? Well, I mean, it was, um, I mean, it just, it still needed more refinement. So, you know, we hadn't been through the feasibility study, both financially and um, technologically speaking, with Now Electric. So it was really hard to tell if it was feasible. Um, so we, what we did, uh, honestly, was just invest a lot of money into it um, to, you know, just get like all the, understand what the permitting realities were going to be, understand what the community response is going to be, of course, but the kind of like a low profile operation early on, but it was really largely focused on the interconnect study and whether or not we could do what we proposed, which was um, pro providing the island with about 41% of their energy with solar, and then half of the production would be used for time shifting so we can actually do solar at night. And, you know, it took, it took almost like um, 18 months to get through that process with Maui Electric. Mm. And, so, Michael, uh, Michael kind of you were, you've been um, doing good feedback. We were able to come up with a commercial structure um, that works for Maui Electric that, that appears to will work with the rate structure for Molokai and, and will work for us. So it was, you know, just trying to satisfy all the different stakeholders. Well, what's the status of your project right now, Michael? Uh, we're still in negotiations. Um, there's still a couple of remaining um, scenarios that Maui wants us to run, uh, just regarding you know contingencies. What happens when there's outages, like a pole goes down in Mauna Loa? Can they can can they reroute the energy and turn everybody back on in a reasonably short time frame? So there's a lot of technical back and forth that we're still kind of fine tuning. Um, and then obviously another huge part of this is, is um, understanding what the community's response is going to be. So starting earlier this summer, uh, we started doing a lot of just grassroots door-to-door -door, um, talking with, with locals and then, you know, meeting with businesses, meeting with other government officials and, um, you know, residents that we're aware of that were typically activists against any kind of development. What, kind of, reaction, what kind of reaction have you been getting? I'm sorry? What kind of reaction have you been getting from, from your uh, walkabouts? I mean, you know, we, we've been warned countless times that, you know, developing anything in Molokai is difficult and there's a great deal of suspicion about, you know, mainlanders coming in and trying to 
do like big resorts or something. And, you know, but once we kind of like shared what our plan was, it was pretty favorable. Um, the, 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 the overall response that we received is because, you know, it's a pretty benign project and we're offering renewable energy and in, in a rate that's, you know, affordable. So there's really nothing, it's hard to object to that. And so we, you know, we, but, you know, again, we are still very cautious about how we would do this. We want to make sure that they're accepting because we're going to be there for a long time. Yeah. We don't want to have a bad relation with your, with your neighbors. So, um, you know, so we, we had actually a large um, meeting back in early October where we invited pretty much everyone on the island. We had a really good turnout, a couple hundred people, mm-hmm. and a really productive, it was a good four-hour meeting. It was all videotaped. I think you can get it on, on Akula's website if you're looking for a link to that, but I'll share it with you later if you're interested. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we just took open um, questions and answers, and it was pretty remarkable. I mean, we left feeling very good that, you know, there was definitely a path forward um, with with the locals, and that was that was that that yes. made us feel very optimistic. And, and as you say, started. that's very important in Molokai. Marco, uh, uh, Marco, have you got some question? You no, know, I gotta warn you, Michael. Marco's questions are more incisive than mine. I'm just I'm just a superficial fellow. Marco has questions because he's very well familiar with all of this. I think, right, Marco? Well, uh, I guess I'll let the uh, the questions or comments speak for themselves. Yeah, I, as a preface, I first want to say. Having been involved, uh, had Molokai part of my blood for the past 50 years, it's a very important and kind of near and dear uh, to me as far as what happens on that island. And I am uh, excited and encouraged by what Michael's company is uh, trying to do because I think being able to turn that island and have it be conceivably the first island in the chain to reach 100% renewable in terms of power generation is uh, is very exciting and uh, that said uh, having been involved on that island as long as i have been i'm fully aware as michael uh, <laughs> mentioned as well the various challenges uh, and uh, the kind of knee-jerk uh, reaction on the part of certain locals there and certain groups to uh, the change where they re- represent or what they see as a as a threat to the to the lifestyle and the culture of the island, which really hasn't changed a whole lot, at least the 50 years that I've known it. And so those challenges, as, as Michael knows and anybody knows uh, who's tried to do business there, and I've done some business there myself over the years, uh, those, those, uh, that resistance can be formidable. The pushback can be formidable. So mm-hmm. I think it's really encouraging that Michael mm-hmm. was able to uh, so far navigate those waters uh, carefully, thoughtfully, and, uh, and uh, so far with some yeah, so I guess one of my questions, um, first questions to you, Michael, would be what kind of time deadline do you guys have internally in terms of you know, negotiations with the utility company can take a long time, as you know, and as I've learned in the past as well. What kind of deadline do you have internally in order to, uh, to move forward to, uh, that you need to wrap up these uh, discussions with Miko and be able to come to an agreement on a power purchase agreement that would... Uh, I would think soon thereafter be submitted to our Public Utilities Commission for their review and their determination. Yes, I'd like to uh, remember what uh, Tom McCain, when he was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, said is that he never told himself that he was getting out in a day or a week or a month. He said, I'm getting out someday. And, you know, we're, I, I, it's going to happen. Um, and that's kind of like the approach we're taking with. Uh, Wine Electric is because it's kind of a first of its kind project for the utility. So they've got a, they you know obviously what what is their responsibility? They've got uh, cost and reliability are the two things that they they have to be laser focused on when getting stuff through the PUC. And so um, that just simply has taken time. And you know we've been going through this for uh, we're in, we're into our third year. And if you add Princeton at, on top of it, this project's been under development for four years already. Uh, but again, the big breakthroughs have been recent that give us um, kind of like optimism that we might be able to get everything uh, ready for signature and a power purchase agreement in the next couple of months if, if things continue to go this way. And then we know that the PUC is going to take another six to nine months after that. So we're still looking at, you know, the earliest commercial operation date wouldn't be until, 
you know, honestly, probably like early first quarter 2019. If that's if that's and that's if everything goes silky smooth, which you know they don't ever. So, um, you know, we, we our, our our investors and we we look for signals and triggers that uh, allow us to put more money into a project. Like if we if we feel it's a you know good calculated risk, we'll continue investing in it. And now we're kind of at that point where we're willing to kind of double down to try to accelerate the time frame. But I can't, you know, again, I, I don't know the exact day yet. Okay, um, uh, Marco, Marco, we're going to take a short break now, a one-minute break. We'll be right back when, uh, Marco, you can continue to drill down on this, and uh, we can we can figure out, and I would, I would suggest one question, and, and that is uh, how much does this mean to Molokai? How important is this project? for the development of energy on Molokai. Let's take a short break and come right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, the Prince of Investing. I'm your host. Prince Dykes, each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time. I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe. And real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Thank you. Okay, welcome back to Mina, Marco, and me, and Michael on Monday, talking about uh, Michigan, Minnesota. Minster, uh, Mauna Loa, Maui, and uh, Maui Electric, I suppose. I'm trying to go for 10 on the M's. Uh, and we oh, have then you have, you have a McCain. McCain, thank you, McCain. We're, I think we're there. Um, Michael Hastings joins us by Skype from Chicago. He's the CEO of Half Moon Power, doing a project in Molokai. And, of course, our regular co-host, uh, Marco Mangelsdorf, joins us from ProVision Solar in Hilo. Uh, Marco, you, you were uh, having some questions with Michael? And I'll just add one more M, which is, you two look marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hear the well, bell one of the things that I think is inevitable in terms of the, uh, let's, let's assume optimistically that you uh, come to agreement with Maui Electric and Hawaiian Electric, the parent company of MECO, and that a docket is opened and the PPA is provided to the commission for their review. Uh, that there are multiple uh, forces, shall we say, that come into play in terms of their consideration of something of this importance. Uh, and even though people uh, would like to say that, well, politics really doesn't play a part in any kind of decision like this, it should be based on ratepayer best interests, it should be based on, uh, on a number of other kind of more tangible factors other than politics, it's clear that, as we saw in the the effort uh, on the part of next year to buy uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries that uh, most people uh, would tell you that <laughs> politics definitely played a role. And it helped, of course, that uh, the governor of the state of Hawaii came out against the deal. So I, my question to you, Michael, is uh, so far, now you've, you've been into this now for several years, and I, I don't know how much money you've spent up until now, your company has spent, but i got to believe that it's a, non, a non-trivial amount. Uh, what have you learned so far in terms of the, the role that the politics, both on the island of Molokai and in the state, is going to play in a decision like this? I mean, it's, it's deeply pervasive. I mean, the you know, all the different constituents and stakeholders um, – all play a significant role in this. I mean, we've we've met with countless state and um, federal politicians, all the PUC members. We've gotten to know the folks at uh, both Hawaiian Electric and Maui Electric pretty well. Um, and so we, you know, we know like how the system kind of operates there. So it's really about trying to get everyone to buy in, which you know. But at the end of the day, this is still a relatively small project. In, in you know in the portfolio of Maui Electric and, and Eco Electric on top of that, 
Um, it represents less than 1% of, of Maui's um, generation capacity. Um, so it's just, it's really a tiny percentage. And to us, it's a, um, it's a good starting point for, you know, a very aggressive political um, agenda, which is getting Hawaii to 100%. So um, I think a lot of folks would agree it's a, it's a good starting point to kind of um, fine tune this and, and get a good, a good operating project for the other islands to look at. But really, at the end of the day, though, what we're trying to do is, you know, just offer reliable solar to the people of Molokai to help with rate relief. And that's that's been um, almost impossible with solar and um, energy storage until the past couple of years is, you know, all these um, products have become commoditized and a lot more affordable now. So now, it, you know, and the technology's improved. So we're confident we can get to where we need to be on that. Yeah, Marco, you're really familiar with Molokai. You've been over there, you know, working and visiting for years and years, as you said. And I wonder if you could help me with, um, the, you know, whether this is an important project for Molokai, whether Molokai, in fact, needs this, um, you know, to supply energy and to do renewables and hopefully to do renewables at a, at a good price. Uh, how important is this project to Molokai? Hey, say sorry, that again. Jay, you, were, you were kind of cutting you were in breaking and out up. there. Oh, sorry. How important is this project to Molokai? I think it would be enormously important. Uh, I mean, if it were to happen, then uh, within the next several years, Molokai would be pretty darn close uh, to 100% renewable in terms of power generation. If it weren't to happen, then it'll continue to uh, to limp along, uh, and uh, and it'll take a very different course. I, I think it's a it's a it's a very big uh, a very big move in, in in a positive direction. If it were to uh, if all the, the stars were to align and all the M words were to uh, to sound uh, uh, sweet, uh, I think it'd be a very very big thing to the folks who live there and uh, and and for the state at large. Let me ask you this too. So this would be a substantial amount of um, uh, kilowatts for um, Molokai megawatts. Um, and if you wanted to get, if you want to do this project. Do it now, you know, start it up in 2019, hopefully by then or soon thereafter. Uh, what, what follows? What would be the plan to follow to make Molokai 100%? Well, th this type of system where you have a battery that can be, you know, a battery is very versatile, so you can, you can perform different functions at different times. What's interesting is down the road is that, you know, one of the problems with Molokai right now has been the suspension of the rooftop generation because they're generating too much during off peak and not enough during peak. So they've had to curtail and um, kind of table uh, rooftop solar, which has got a lot of people upset because, you know, there's a couple hundred that are stuck in the queue. They just, the, the grid just accept it right now. Uh, but what a project like this can do is help enable more distributed generation, which is, I think, what we've learned, at least, is that's very important to the people of Molokai to keep their independence and have their own generation source. So um, this does pave the way toward that. It'll take more batteries and more solar, but, I mean, effectively, if and when this project is completed, the island will be, you know, nearly two-thirds solar, which is fantastic. It is fantastic. So, what, you know, I was telling you guys that there was an article in PBN this morning about um, about Kauai, about a project that KIUC is doing that wraps around solar and uh, pumped hydro. It'll be the first time that Hawaii has done pumped hydro, and good for KIUC for being adventurous in, in that regard. But I'm thinking of Molokai, too. I'm thinking Molokai has the elevations, it has the water, um, and, you know, there's a lot of undeveloped land up the hill there. I'm, I'm wondering if um, in that next phase, you know, that one-third remaining, if you will, um, that pumped hydro and the KIUC kind of plan would be useful. I mean, we, we would need to think carefully about that. I mean, it's, um, I, I don't know is the, is the immediate answer. Yeah, there's a lot of land, um, you know, near Kanaka Kai that, you know, could be suitable for this. But, um, you know, to me, like intuitively, it feels like it, you know, if you want to kind of balance the, generation, you'd want to have it more distributed across the island. So you're not, you know, just from a security and uh, reliability perspective, it might make more sense to have generation elsewhere on the island. Mm -hmm. 
But I, I am not a technical engineer, so I can't really uh, elaborate on that too greatly. Yeah, what do you think, Marco? I think I would comment, uh, guys, that water issues, as we know, across the state are, are quite uh, quite a hot issue, uh, so to speak, and, and, a, and a very, can be very contentious. And I can tell you, based on my time on Molokai, that water rights and the availability of water where and when is, is a very, very contentious issue. So mm. I think uh, it's a different order of magnitude uh, to try to conceive and, and think you can pull this off on Molokai compared to Kauai. So I, I don't see pumped hydro on Molokai as being cards anytime in the near future. I mean, if, if it's going to be a challenge to do EV plus storage near the one and only Miko power plant outside of Kanakakai, which it is going to be a challenge, mm -hmm. doing pumped hydro on that island, I think, is many orders of magnitude much, much more difficult. <clears throat> well, assuming it goes forward, you know, past the two thirds and into, you know, closer to 100% using. Using um, solar, of course, and uh, and batteries, <clears throat> as in this uh, half moon project, uh, will will Molokai will Molokai be able to uh, reduce the cost to the consumer? Uh, will Maui Electric be able to uh, you know reduce the cost to the consumer? And uh, I, I know um, you know ideally we have uniform rates around the state, but that's not immediate. That's not coming soon. Um, but but what about on Molokai? Can Mo Molokai, Molokai has very high rates now. Uh, what effect would this project and projects like it have on, on rates to the consumer? So, as you know, the price of diesel has collapsed the past couple of years, which really made it more challenging for us to come up with a price that would be acceptable um, to, you know, everyone, to the residents, to the MECO, and to the PUC, the consumer advocate. But, um, you know, despite that, uh, threat of substitution. We were also, you know, it's it's we're we're able to offer energy that at below the avoided cost for Molokai right now. So it's like a penny or two lower than than diesel. So we have zero control over the rates that Maui Electric charges. All we all we have to do is hit a benchmark that they're targeting, which is below their their uh, avoided cost. Mm -hmm. And so we've got there. So whether that gets passed down, I I can't really comment on. Well, Marco, what do you think? What are, what are your impressions about uh, the Half Moon project and what's happening on Molokai and how it impacts the general development of renewables in Hawaii? And, for example, how it, how it affects the Hawaiian electric world and, um, and the Big Island, of course, and, uh, and, and energy in the state. What are your thoughts? Well, it's uh, just overall part of a larger mosaic of so many pieces of this uh, energy puzzle. And when it comes to power generation, not even, of course, discussing transportation, which is a whole other mosaic puzzle in and of itself. And mm -hmm. I really salute and admire the folks uh, from Michael's company and others who who have taken on these uh, almost Sisyphean tasks. I mean, I knew that uh, or I had a feeling that Michael and his company were involved for the past uh, couple of years or so, 18 months, but I didn't know what was going on. So it really shows the, uh, the dedication and commitment and, and the heart to be able to want to do something big and bold and really good for the for the community. And, uh, you know, kind of all eyes are on, um, on Maui Electric at this point to see whether uh, they, uh, when all is said and done, are able to pull the trigger on a power purchase agreement, which... Um, can really realistically only hope to provide some savings for uh, for electric bills for those 2,000 or so, two 3,000 now electric customers on, on Molokai, but ultimately uh, not going to be super dramatic savings as far as I know, and of course Michael knows the numbers a lot better than I do, but uh, saving money is only part of the, the puzzle, it's part of the mosaic, and another big part I think is doing right for the community, doing right for the island and anything that can be done to dramatically decrease the uh, amount of fossil fuels coming into that island to power its economy, I think, is a very good thing. Yeah, it's interesting. All eyes on Molokai. Molokai becomes a kind of laboratory for the neighbor islands anyway. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, setting up the show with Michael Hastings, Marco. Uh, and uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us by Skype from so far away in Chicago. Thank, thank you for having us today. And I, I hope when you Let's get here next time, time you will have you back in the next couple months. Yeah, good. Well, look us up. We can that. do this in person. 
Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Marco. And uh, I'll, I'll yeah, talk sure. to you soon. We'll have another show in two weeks. More of Marco, Mina, and me on Monday. And, uh, and in the meantime, enjoy. Enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday.